this is really, uh, really, really good to be back here again. So uh, I'm going to kick it off with a little bit of, um, uh, of, a, of a framer, let's say. Um, because we live in very interesting times. And uh, I must say uh, that uh, they're good ones. Um, Earlier this year, we, we refined uh, our mission and vision. Um, has anybody not seen this? Anybody not seen this before? A few of you? Okay, well. Um, we're wearing it on T-shirts now. We, we got our, our mission down to something we can actually put on a T-shirt. And it was important to me that it was something that wasn't a brand, uh, that it was something that any Moodler could wear um, uh, because it's the mission of the project. Uh, and this is what we're, we're here for. We're here to empower educators to improve our world. And we're, we're trying to give the world the most effective platform for learning. Now, these are words. Um, why have we chosen these words? And I want to go into a little bit about that first and, um, and see where that takes us. So as Uncle Ray was saying, and I was loving hearing it, um, that's Mother Earth, right? We're all on that. And um, it's becoming clearer, uh, I think, um, how uh, fragile this thing is that we're on and how important it is that we look after it. And the many, many uh, people and cultures have been saying that for a long time and we've been kind of, a lot of us have been ignoring it because we're too busy looking at our smartphones and TVs lately. Um, there's good news, right? There's, it's not all bad news. If you look at stats from the last uh, 200 years, um, most of the basic stuff, we, we're actually improving. So we are improving. Uh, extreme poverty is dropping. Basic education is increasing. Uh, about half the countries in the world have a democracy now. Whether or not it's a well-implemented well, uh, democracy is another matter. But 86% uh, of the world gets vaccinations, uh, child mortality. We're, we're only down to 4% of our children dying before they're five. 15% um, still can't read. Um, but that's a lot better than it was. And th things are generally improving. There's a lot, a lot of good things. But if you look at the UN Sustainable Goals, they've identified 17 big uh, problems and things we need to work on to actually make the planet sustainable, which, you know, I'm not, uh, um, I'm not a hippie by any, by any, uh, by any stretch. This is, this is serious stuff. This is stuff we actually need to do to keep this thing we're living on uh, livable in the, in the next hundred years. Um, so... Very, very critical stuff. So from my point of view, I don't see any reason why any enterprise on Earth shouldn't be connected to that. Like there literally isn't, you can't really think of a good reason why it shouldn't be connected to that, right? Because survival is kind of everything, unless you have a, a death wish, in which case, um, you know, bye. But um, it, we, we do need to connect what we do to the important things. And... Some of those, are the, the ones I find most critical to work on, are the ones that a lot of them we've created kind of recently. These are th problems that have actually got worse recently because of our impact. So we have huge inequality going on. We've got food and water security uh, getting worse in lots of places. We've got a refugee crisis of 65 million people, homeless, uh, transient, uh, and that's rising. We've got climate change. Um, we've got the problems of how we deal with all our own information or our own data that we are creating. Uh, we are now interacting in new and exciting ways and, and we're owning each other's data. We are sharing data with each other. We don't really know how to deal with that yet. It's all so new. Uh, and there are people out there who are uh, fighting over that stuff. We have um, automation coming in, about to wipe out a whole uh, strata of jobs. You know, we, we, we did it once already with agriculture, and we're going to be doing it again and again. 
but we don't really have plans for what people are going to do and how they're going to survive uh, once these jobs get replaced. We've got healthcare quality. So it's okay to say healthcare is improving, but it's the quality of that healthcare, right? Um, uh, and education quality as well. What is the quality of education? Uh, not just the basics of being literate, but how do people become citizens, right? To, to solve all those things, that's what I think we need, right? We need to have a whole generation of people who are globally oriented, who are multiculturally aware. So things like refugees become a lot less of a problem if you're aware that there are other cultures, that there are other people, and that they're in that situation because of reasons. Um, we, need to, we need to all be environmentalists because it's literally the house we're living in. And caring citizens, people who actually can run a democracy properly. So people who can actually vote and take part and have initiatives and uh, make changes and, and all those things. Now there's a whole heap of really encouraging stuff going off on everywhere. I've got a 16 year old daughter who at the drop of the hat will go and write to the Prime Minister. And the whole, there's a whole generation of, of people who are, you know, kids who are doing great stuff. But um, I, I still think we, we do need to do better overall because there's still huge problems in the world and they aren't going to be fixed by a simple letter. So it comes down to education and I, I know a lot of you kind of agree with me. You're in education because you believe it's important. Education is, across all subjects, needs to support the next generation to kind of fix the mess that we're, we've, we've, we've put things in. I love having a good rant like this, thank you. Um, so a bit more ranting, right? Can government solve education? This is just a very simplistic view because I'm a simple person and I like to think simply, but most governments, they tend to focus on short-term election cycles, don't they? You, don't, you rarely hear about, you know, 30-year initiatives um, and, and sometimes when you do, they get cut down three years later by the next government. Um, they're not really thinking about generational improvements very often and it's just the nature of the beast of how that works. And you get this feeling, it doesn't really matter who I vote for. Um, and not, not just in Australia, in a lot of countries. And there's these, these economic drivers, and they, they just tend to always impact education by decreasing money to public education, and more administration on top of the education systems that are there. And there's this focus more and more on training people for, for the workforce, not creating that as much. So that's kind of my view. I, I, I know, and, and it's a great, lot of things, good things happening in government as well. There's a lot of good people doing good things, but I'm just saying that there's this tendency for it not to be as effective. And there's a lot of go round and a lot of initiatives that start and get implemented and then don't continue. And there's a lot of waste and inefficiency. And I can see some people nodding because you probably work at a, at a TAFE or a university or something. So, you know, I hear, I hear all those stories all the time and so do you. Like, can, is capitalism going to solve education, right? All the apps, all these amazing new dot-coms and things. Well, they, I, I went uh, in February, I went to a conference in Silicon Valley. It was called SASTA, S-A-A-S-T-R. It's a, one of the biggest conferences you've never heard of. It had 10,000 software company CEOs all in one building. Uh, every app on my phone, basically, the CEO is there. And they're all talking to each other about uh, how to hack their software companies for growth, basically. And they're all talking about cost of acquisitions of clients and lifetime values and exponential curves and all that sort of stuff. And it's all about profit. Because when I, I, I talk to a lot of them, I go, okay, great, you've got a, an app. Why? Half of them couldn't give me an answer why. Like, it was about the money, right? Um, and most companies are, are totally designed about maximizing excess cash. They're building cash machines to spew off cash, 
which goes to the people who invested in the company in the first place, um, usually venture capitalists. Now, capitalism kind of assumes the model of it, always said, you know, Milton Friedman, etc. They, they talk about capitalism as a self-balancing thing, you know, it'll work itself out, people will build companies to fill a need and the, the demand will drive the system. But there's, there's no, the environment isn't starting companies. The, the children and the, the, the poor are not starting companies, so they're kind of underrepresented here. They don't have any influence in that system. And as a result, you have a situation where, I don't want to pick on the US, but I will, because like 5% of the population there demonstrably has 25% of the world's wealth and 30% of the world's resources. It requires 30% of the world's resources just to run. So that system, which is notoriously, um, uh, has a lot of, uh, of, of capitalistic companies, uh, that model can't exist everywhere. Just mathematically, there's just not enough earth to go around, right? Um, and yet, in the US, there's still areas with ter terrible poverty. Like it's in some cities, it's just, you know, there's slums basically, and it's, it's amazing. Um, and I love the US. Uh, I, I love a lot about it, but there is, this, uh, there is this, this issue that it seems to be a runaway train. Silicon Valley, they're, they're focused, because they're focused on money, most of the products, if you look at them, they're all designed to be grabby, right? So one, one uh, platform, say Netflix, you know, uh, adds uh, autoplay, so that, you know, you've just finished an episode and, oh, it starts the next one magically, I'll just keep binge watching, right? It just sucks you in, right? And these devices are just sucking us in, you can feel it. And then, you know, YouTube does the same thing. They add autoplay, and then Hulu adds autoplay, and they all add autoplay, right? And, they all, and they're all, um, th there's some great talks out there from the people who design these systems who are explicitly grabbing your next five seconds of attention because they're selling that to the highest bidder, basically, in most of these systems. So they're thinking about your next five seconds and make, making sure you look at whatever they want you to look at. But they're not thinking about your life as a person. Uh, they're not thinking about your existence on the planet or, you know, the whole society or anything. They're just focused on, on that cash machine. So, you know, I'm seeing this all happening around me and it's extremely worrying, right? And I happen to be in a position where I'm, I'm in, I have a, a, a little software company and, and a project here where we can actually make a bit of difference. So this is why it's so interesting to me. There is this problem of inequality. These companies, these cash machines, uh, the profits uh, are going to people who are already extremely rich. And the, there's a concentration of power. So only a year ago, the bottom 50% of the whole earth, of the population of the earth, the, the wealth that they owned, was equal to the top 143 people last year. So 143 people, same wealth as the bottom 50%. That was about a year ago. In January, that number was eight. And last June, it's down to five. So like, there is like, I wish I could do a really good midnight oil impression here, but like the richer getting richer, I'm the, good, the right city for that actually. Um, that, that is really happening more and more and more and uh, there is quite, quite uh, once you start looking into it, quite interesting things going on up there in the stratosphere. I mean, pretty sure uh, at this rate we'll all be working for one person at, at some point. Now, the language that you hear around this, and I heard it a lot in, in San Francisco, is that they say disrupt, replace, control. Right? It's all about, here's a system, it's stuffed, we're going to disrupt it with a new system, which is usually not better, but somehow it's got that grabby, that grabby quality about it that makes it take over the other system and it starts generating cash for somebody. So it's, it's kind of a leech thing. Um, that's, that's not how you fix the planet. 
I'm sorry, I, I can't see that working. For me, fixing means supporting, nurturing, improving what we have. So you all work at like institutions uh, which uh, are doing a great job. Um, I, I know you all complain about it and we're all complaining about it, but the fact is that there's pretty good things are happening and uh, I don't think you need to be replaced by apps. I think you need help. I think, I think we all need help. I think all education needs help. Um, but there's nothing fundamentally wrong with people teaching other people uh, how, to, how, to, uh, how to be better at things. So when I look around, the only thing that I've seen, and this is not new for the last 15, 20 years, the only movement that I see in the world that has a chance of having a long-term benefit uh, is open projects. Because open projects, they're not restricted to a particular company or a person or a government. Or, a, or anything like that. They're, they're, a, they're a kind of movement or a tool that humanity owns in some way, that everybody owns them, right? And there's all these movements going on out there in open standards, open government, open data, uh, open research, and open source, of course. And so that's why Moodle was open source in the first place. Um, and I have to say, I've pretty much had my head down, stuck inside the Moodle bucket for the last 15 years, just working on Moodle. Um, but in the past year or two, I've really started to reach out to these other open projects and I think Moodle needs to be real, really part of that universe because that's, I think, what's going to improve things uh, as we go forward. So, to get towards the end of my ranting here, um, for me, empowering educators is one of the best things we can do. For me, empowering educators means that you are trying to make quality education a basic human right. Not a, not a privilege, not, a, not, not something you have to pay extra for. Like the best school or university should be the one that's the one you can walk to. Um, teachers should be respected like doctors, politicians, I'm gonna say celebrities, because I mean, how many times do you hear about celebrities? Jeez, I mean, I, I, it took me ages to get a, a Wikipedia page, but I was, uh, <laughs> um, I, I noticed though, if you played flute on uh, one track on the third album of some band in the 70s, you'd have a massive Wikipedia page. Um, so there's, there's certainly imbalance in, in, uh, in things like that. But... Um, uh, you know, you, hear, you, hear, you see CEOs on the news, sitting in the Qantas lounge or something, and you know, you see the headlines. That's the only time I get to see TV news. Um, but uh, you know, you're seeing this CEO saying that, the CEO saying that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here's a CEO saying something, ironically. But um, the you, you, you don't hear from teachers. You don't see teachers being respected in public very often. Um, and, and by respect, I don't just mean that kind of lip service and publicity, I mean pay as well. Like you should be paid to be a teacher at a, at a rate like a doctor. I mean, there's, there's simply nothing more important than teaching the next generation in my point, in my, my view. So teachers should be uh, supported well, they should need, with tools as well, ongoing professional development, uh, good unrestricted content. You shouldn't have to be worrying about uh, copyright issues all the time and all those, oh my god, that's, I worked at Curtin on a whole lot of copyright stuff for that university and it was the most painful thing in the universe. It just killed the life out of everything. Um, that's, that's not how, how it should be. You should have the best resources. You should just be able to reach for them and use them to actually do your job. And the last thing that I think is really important is that that in a good education system, we should be promoting the global, cross-cultural collaboration. Because we can now. We all have these computers in our pockets. We can be talking directly with anybody. Um, but we don't that much. Um, but this sort of stuff should be much more promoted. Because that's the only way we can solve these big problems. So that's why the mission is that. And that's why uh, we have this vision, 
Now, it's been pointed out that that's a pretty bland thing because it doesn't have any, it doesn't say what we're learning or, or it doesn't promote any particular agenda or anything. Well, that's why we have these, we have values attached to this. So we have five values and they're, we treat education, we value education, and we, we treat it as a value. Education's part of every communication that we have. Openness, I've already spoken about, but also openness for accessibility, uh, international culture. Um, respect, so we're always trying to promote respect in the team, but also with competitors and outside. We try and be, uh, we try and be, uh, show integrity, be ethical. And finally, we're trying to be innovative and support innovation. And open source inherently does this. There's so much innovation on top of Moodle, and a lot of you are doing it. Um, but it's, it's part of the energy of a group of people that if you give them the power to do things, that they will. Um, and, and a lot of good things come out of it. So with those values and our vision and mission, I think Moodle was set up to go in a good direction. Now, our numbers are growing, and this is the responsibility we have. We have 84,000 plus registered sites, um, and that number's still going up. Um, and, and I've been traveling a lot more lately. I've chosen uh, in the past year or two to not only go to Moodle events, even though I could seriously just go to Moodle events non-stop. Um, but I go to other education events, conferences. So I went to something called ABED in Brazil. There's 2,000 people. Uh, and I said to them, okay, everybody stand up. And everyone stood up. And I said, okay, everyone who, I, I, I said, put your hand out on the, your on the shoulder of the person next to you. I said, okay, you're all connected. It feels good, doesn't it? I said, everyone who doesn't use Moodle, sit down. It was like 10% of people sat down. This is in the middle in the jungle of Brazil. 90% of them were using Moodle. This was not a Moodle conference. This was just a general education conference. Um, I said, I'm sorry to the 10% who had to, had to disconnect from the network. But, um, and I've been to Russia, I've been to, uh, to Tel Aviv and, and so on. And, and it's amazing, actually, um, the kind of reception that Moodle gets. A lot of people had no idea where it came from or what it really was um, or um, they're so totally dependent on it that, um, uh, that uh, you know, they're, just, they're thrilled that someone's talking about it because, you know, we don't, we don't have a $100 million marketing budget like some companies to go out and do this at every conference, generally. So doing this has been really good. People are going, oh, well, yeah, Moodle really exists. There's really people behind it. So um, there is a ability that we have to this project. Now, it was at one of these uh, events, it was the one in Israel, um, where I met some people and it developed into this uh, news. So I got some big news. This is an announcement. This is something that has not been announced before. Uh, so I'm going to tell you now. We've been looking for ways to grow faster. I get up here at these moots every year and I say, hey, we're doing these things and these are our plans and we're going to work on this stuff. And then for the next year, we struggle along with the team we have. Probably 80% of what we're doing is maintenance because let's face it, 80% of all life is maintenance, right? We're all thinking of your spouses and your homes right now. 80% um, <clears throat> of life is maintenance. So, you know, with the team we have, we, we can't push forward as fast as I'd like and as fast as you'd like. Um, I've been really looking hard for ways to grow faster and talking to a lot of people. We fi finally found an investor that we really like. I must have talked with about 50. Um, and at some point, it's pretty clear that they're part of that framework I was just describing, right? Not a good fit for us. But this is different. So I want to announce today, uh, this is the, a bit of a screenshot from our press release. Um, we just got uh, $6 million investment from a European uh, family. Now this family 
it's, just, it's, not, it's not just a mum and a dad and a couple of kids. Um, this is a, a, a very large organisation. Um, I'll give you a chance to read that. They are um, most well known for a company called Decathlon. Has anybody heard of Decathlon here? A couple of people. It's a sports company. And you think, gee, that's a weird fit, sports company. Well, it's not really the company that's, that's uh, investing, it's the family. But um, what I found really amazing was, as I talked to them and got to know them over some months, um, was how close culturally their fit was and the way, they, the way they do things and the way they run their companies with the way I'd like to run our company and the, the way I'd, I'd like to see things being done. Um, this company, uh, Decathlon, as an example, is 80,000 people, uh, something like 10 billion euros revenue a year. Uh, they, there are thousands of uh, locations around the world. I think they're opening in Sydney like very soon, I think next month or something. They're kind of like the IKEA of sports stuff. Now, I'm not a retail person, but what I was so impressed with was when I looked at their strategy and their, their own um, mission and the way they run things, they're not profit oriented. They have, a, they have uh, rules in place to keep their profits down. Um, they, across those 80,000 people also, the culture is really interesting. They, they only have four levels of management across 80,000 people. And that's because the staff are empowered to, do it, to innovate uh, and to manage themselves. Uh, and they have really, really lots, I could talk all day about these things and you can ask me later, I won't go on to it. But anyway, um, I did spend a lot of time with these folks, I really like them and um, we've, we've, uh, we've hooked up. So they have an organisation called Education for the Many and uh, that's, that's the entity that's in, invested in Moodle. Uh, they have a very small uh, share of the equity. It's tiny. It's not, they don't have any control of Moodle by any stretch. Um, and that's, they're not interested in, uh, they say they're not interested in exits. They're not interested in, there's no talk about particular uh, targets or anything like that. They're all about Moodle. And so, unfortunately, I can't show you, uh, I haven't got a video or anything so you can meet these guys, but... Um, if you read that, that's a quote that gives you a bit of an idea where their, where their thinking is at. Um, so I'll give you a minute to read that. The bit with my name there, I, I substitute Moodle for that. It's not just me, it's the whole team. But um, I hope you can read that at the back. Can you? Do you want me to read it out? Is it okay? All right. um, the, these people really believe in what we're doing. They're just here to support what we're doing. And um, it's like having a big friend. It's really great. So, um, this is great news for the Moodle community. This is great news for the Moodle product. Um, this gives us escape velocity to get to a, a higher orbit. The whole project is about sustainability. Like, this Moodle project has never been in debt, ever. Uh, and our intention is to keep it that way. As we get to this new level, uh, a higher, bigger oper operation, it's going to be sustainable at that level. Right? Um, because we're building something for a long time here. We're not building something to generate cash. So it's time to make Moodle amazing. You've got a good chance here. So what are we going to do? Well, fortunately, I've been cooking up a lot of plans. So <clears throat> um, a lot of this has come into focus this year. Uh, as we've been collecting uh, ideas from the past, looking at the environment we're in, and uh, the plan 
is getting sharper and sharper and we're now uh, executing a lot of these pieces. So there are five big major projects, if you like, that we're working on. Moodle, the software that you're using, is the one at the top there. All of them connect and work together and in a couple of years, you'll just say that's Moodle. All of them will be Moodle. But let's just talk about the, the five different projects and I'll break them down for you and explain uh, what they are and how they fit together a bit. So Moodle itself, let's talk a bit about Moodle. I've got a bit of different bits of news here. So uh, the main focus with Moodle itself is, is usability is number one. So making it look and feel slick, uh, making the workflows as short as possible. Um, we've made some strides towards that recently. There's more to do. Uh, but uh, that's, that's really the number one focus is usability. Uh, integrations with things. We want to make Moodle seamless across devices. So I like to use the example that I'm on my phone and I'm, on, I'm replying on the, on the app to a forum post and I'm typing and I'm going, ah, oh, screw this, it's too small. And then I go across to a bigger device and I could just keep going on the same post, right? Because it, it should just like drift, you should drift between the, whatever device you've got to hand and it should work. Like that's the kind of future I think um, where we're going. The last bit is Moodle needs to become an active participant in learning. And by that I mean it's not teaching as such, but it is talking, it's supporting teachers, computer-aided teaching, computer-aided learning. It's a voice. Moodle has a voice. Uh, it's talking to you, it's chatting to you, it's notifying you, uh, and you can talk to it. So sometimes that may be literally because voice interfaces are really improving. And while, you know, I only use Siri for about two things, um, and, but there are Google Homes, uh, the Google things and the Amazon things are coming up everywhere. That voice technology is getting better and better. And you can see uh, in a couple of years, um, it's, you know, it's only going to get more of it, right? And we already have an example where you can talk to Moodle Cloud. You can actually ask Moodle Cloud how many users are on your site and Alexa will talk back to you. Um, uh, we, things like that are just going to become more and more common. So, so Moodle will continue to be the system it is, which is a core platform with plugins integrated to other systems, and you access it via a variety of devices. Now, I've got some VR here as well, VR and augmented reality. I don't, I don't propose that Moodle is going to be a big shape uh, in 3D and we're going to all be navigating Moodle in 3D. Although, um, one of our developers, John, uh, will I think it's 2 o'clock today, is it John? Where He's demoing a, a little experiment he did where he turned uh, the quiz into some 3D uh, shoot, shoot 'em up game. And you can try it out here, it's set up somewhere here, you can try it out. But in general, um, I don't think Moodle is going to be very useful uh, if we act, everything is like that. No, where, where it's going to be most useful is if you're teaching a subject and there is a virtual reality or an augmented reality experience for that, so a simulation or something that you want your students to do, that in Moodle you could set that as an activity, assign it as an activity, uh, Students go and do it, put on their glasses, they're in there doing the thing. If there's any assessment that happens inside that activity, which is going to be in a third party app usually, yeah, um, we want that assessment to come back into Moodle's gradebook. So there needs to be a standard for pushing that data back into Moodle, much like LTI, if you're familiar with LTI. That doesn't exist yet. There's no VR, AR standards there that, that I think we need to develop that uh, and make it an open standard. The second uh, thing I'd like to see is that I think teachers would like to see after you, you see your results of oh yeah all the students did that activity, uh, oh I want to see, actually want to watch Johnny doing that. So you would click on it and put your own glasses on and get a playback and you know Johnny's doing the experiment and you can walk around him and you can actually see it you know in your own space and you could 
you know, maybe it's a simulation of uh, something dangerous, you know, uh, heavy machinery or nuclear, nuclear handling or something like that. So um, that, that's where I think Moodle will fit in as kind of doing what it does now, which is just managing the learning, not, not necessarily being in VR itself. That said, I'm sure people will come up with some pretty funky interfaces. Uh, Moodle 3.4 is, uh, we've just mostly focused on usability. We've not added any real new features. Uh, the, bigger, the bigger things that have come, are coming in uh, is the calendar overhaul with drag and drop. This is from the MUA, the Moodle Users Association. And there will be a demo, I hope. We were, there, there'll be a meeting this afternoon of the MUA. It's at, what time is it, Hideto? Five o'clock. So anyone's welcome, right? They don't have to be a member. Um, if you are a member, you should go. If you're not and you want to, you want to, maybe you want to become one, go there. Meet Hideto. He's the most nicest, nicest guy uh, uh, from Japan that I've ever met. And that sounded horrible. Sorry. <laughs> He's the nicest guy I know. Let's say that. Um, and uh, I'm just nice to see you here, man. Um, so. We thought we'd actually demo it a bit uh, there as well, so you can see what that looks like. It's pretty cool. It's more drag and drop of stuff around the, the screen. Uh, fixed up the participants and enrollments pages. I think June is talking about that later in the conference today. Yep. What time? 2 p.m. 2 p.m.? Oh, okay, you have to choose. Uh, and uh, the analytics engine Inspire is now in core, and that's, uh, that's moving ahead, so that's uh, what's happening here. 3.5, now I can't, I'm not deciding the roadmap, we, we have other processes the, for that, but, but in general, more simple experience, better integrations, especially open ones, that's, that's how our focus. Uh, the mobile app, which is just the client for, the, um, for Moodle, is really being developing. Uh, in Moodle 3.4, it achieves 100% functionality. The very last module is the workshop module, which will land shortly. Uh, and now the work is to support third-party plugins in the mobile app. We also have a branded Moodle mobile app, so if you want to make uh, a copy, if you want to make your own app with your own interface, we have a service for that. It's about five grand a year. Uh, and we maintain it for you and students will have your institution in the app stores and your, your logo and as soon as they get there they log straight into your site. Um, if you're interested in that, talk to us. We also now have a Moodle desktop app. So it has all the features of the mobile app, it has all the offline abilities and everything but it's on a desktop size. Uh, it works amazingly well, actually. It's, um, some people are preferring it to the web, the web interface. Um, so uh, this can also be branded as well, if you like. But there's free version, of course. And if you're interested in Inspire, uh, the analytics thing, we are collecting data. We've been collecting data from some institutions. We're using the data, long-term data, of institutions to see, because we, we can see how students have gone and what they've done, and then we can see their grades at the end of the course. We're using that sort of data to start helping our prediction models in the analytics. Uh, it's a really interesting system that we've built here. It's kind of a, Inspire is a platform for analytics. It's not saying there's one way to do analytics. It's a platform for researchers to build an, to, and experiment with analytics. Um, at the heart of it is a machine learning piece and we need to train it, so that's why we need data. Lastly, uh, the, the last piece for the, the Moodle open source part of it is uh, we're starting a Moodle foundation, probably early next year. Uh, it'll be based in Europe, probably in Brussels. Uh, it's focused on research driving open source. It's going to be stimulating connections between the Moodle project and research projects. Now, I've, I've been, I said I was going to a lot of other conferences, right? I've been going to a lot of, hello, room on this side. I've been going to um, uh, a lot of conferences, like uh, IEEE conferences. That's like the 
Institute of Engineering Education. And, uh, well, Institute of Engineers, but it's, these are engineering educators generally. And they're research conferences, and they have, you know, 40 papers or something. And I did a count of one that I went to. 70% of the papers involved Moodle. People are using Moodle for their research. So they're like, oh, I've got a great idea of how to teach 1,000 students. I tried it. I implemented this in Moodle. Uh, uh, here are the results. Write the paper. You know, done. And then you never see it again. I'm going, guys, like, you, if, you're not, if you're doing all this research and you're not connecting it to the platform, it's just a waste. It just kind of disappears, right? Yeah, you get a PhD or a master's out of it, but like, it's got to be fed back into the project so that we can build on it. Um, so that's what this is going to do. It's going to be stimulating those kind of research connections. Um, there are also some very large projects happening from the European Commission. Um, probably some of, some of you uh, are involved with the Australian research funding bodies. Um, the stuff in Europe is massive. It's just huge, right? There's millions and millions of euros going into innovation in, in online learning. And uh, nobody ever gives us a call. No one goes, hey, Moodle. They just go, oh, yeah, we'll use Moodle for that. And they just go and do it, right? And then three years later, the funding's finished and it's done. It's like, again, I'm going, guys, just talk to us, you know. So that's what this is all for. And I've got some really good people who are just going to be working on this and, and keeping it connected. So the second of the five is Moodle Cloud. Uh, Moodle Cloud's very straightforward. It's cheap, effective Moodle for anyone. Uh, we have different packages planned for more sectors there. Uh, it does integrations that you can't do on Moodle open source. There are some, some integrations are SaaS type services that you need to sign up with um, at, at a SaaS kind of level. And um, we have plans for bringing MOOCs onto there. And that used to be Moodle Academy. Uh, that, that's the name we had for it. But now it's going to be more integrated into Moodle Cloud. And uh, it allows you to outsource MOOCs to a platform without letting all those grubby people getting into your own IT systems. You can just put courses out there if you want to. Moodle Cloud hasn't changed very much. It's still, uh, um, it's going along really well. We currently have something like 23,000 Moodle sites running on that system. Uh, it's very active. Um, quite, it's amazing to watch it run, actually. It's such a lovely, giant machine. So we'll be developing Moodle Cloud further. Um, number three, learn Moodle. This is new. We, we had a MOOC, you may remember, that runs twice a year called Learn Moodle. Uh, and if you were here yesterday, you probably heard from Tom Murdoch, who uh, leads our education team. Uh, and Tom Murdoch, you might not know, was the founder of Moodle Rooms back in the day. Um, hasn't been there for a long time. But now he works with us, and I'm so glad to have him. So our education team are slaving away right now on building this, which is a a complete curriculum to learn to teach online. Because one of the biggest problems with, with tools like Moodle is that you throw a tool at somebody, it doesn't mean they're going to use it well or effectively. So a lot of it is just how you use it. Um, this curriculum has got a whole bunch of modules. You can imagine it like a mini arts degree and you work towards certifications if you want to. Uh, it'll be delivered through Moodle Partners and uh, at Moodle Moots and other things. Um, and uh, we are very um, pleased. There's a, there's a couple of universities have expressed interest in making this curriculum part of their education curriculum. So if anyone here is interested in that, please talk to Tom. Tom, would you just wave your hand? That's Tom Murdoch. He's here from... Uh, He's home. We dragged him all the way from West Virginia to come here. Um, the, uh, I, I would love to see this because Moodle being open source is a much better proposition to teach at a university than a commercial proprietary product. Uh, I mean to, to young teachers who are learning to teach online. 
so I would like to see it be this kind of open uh, curriculum for those things. Um, what's really different about it is we're not, ju we're not just teaching features as we did with the MCCC, the old certification we had. This is very focused on the, um, the, the pedagogy and the, the ideas behind how you teach online. They're using this model from Michael Shiro, and there's these four columns here. Um, there is four presentations that Tom's running, two today and two tomorrow, on these four things. So if you're interested in finding out more about these different approaches to teaching online, talk to Tom, he's the man. The next one is Moodle Services. So Moodle Services is just an extension of uh, uh, what we have now. For We have Moodle Partners that obviously do a lot of different services and we have integration partners like Big Blue Button and uh, uh, some other ones that are coming soon. Um, so it's about those partnerships, but it's also about connecting users with good services, which is something we've not done very proactively in the past and we want to get more involved. And particularly, there are some uh, very large commercial projects out there. I'm talking like entire countries that are rolling out Moodle. Um, they're often beyond any particular partner and this is about us as a, as, a, as a group looking after these, these large um, instances, these large projects. So we're building up our capabilities here for commercial services and the business development side of things as well, which is what helps keep Moodle uh, running. But the last one, the last of the five, the most exciting one for me is this one, which is brand new. Um, this is MoodleNet. So it's going to replace Moodle.org. Moodle.org has been fine. You know, we've had a Moodle site running the Moodle community for literally 15 years. The same Moodle site has been upgraded. It's time to, you know, maybe give the old girl a rest. Um, so we'll, we'll gently retire that Moodle site and keep it up as an archive, all the forums and so on. Um, but that's not how things work now, right? That site is not where people are because people are in these things. You've just got to walk down the street and bump into 20 people down here to see that. Um, so what we want to build here is a social media platform. And I mean a real social media platform, but for educators. So imagine something like a cross between LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, I don't know, throw them all in there. Um, we actually have some pretty well-defined plans, um, but I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, the, the key things about it are that it's going to be on all your devices, and you'll use the devices for what they're good at. So, um, and it's also integrated with your Moodle site. So imagine you're looking at your course, and it's a blank course because you've just started and you're a new teacher. And on the side is MoodleNet. And you go in there and you need a MoodleNet account. So it's one account for the MoodleNet. Now, to avoid the kind of evil centralization of data, we're looking at a federated system in there so that it's a bit more distributed. But in that MoodleNet, uh, once you go in there, you have a profile. Your profile is you. You have your own reputation. And reputation is very important here. Reputation is what's going to drive a lot of your interactions in the space. So we have a lot of ideas about how to do that using uh, future versions of badges. And there's a lot of research in that, that stuff that we'll be applying, some really cool new stuff. Um, but once you're in there, once you're connected, you can find people who are teaching the same subjects as you in the same languages, and that's your groups, right? So you're now straight away connected with educators who are doing the same stuff as you around the world, outside of your institution, or in your institution if you want. You can make your own groups, but you can have auto groups. Um, those groups are curating content. 
Those groups are picking things that are the content from OER sources that are connected to MoodleNet. And you can, from feeds, you can drag stuff into your course. Just drag it straight in, drop it into your course. So it's a, a way of sharing that discovery and also the creation process, the creation of content. So imagine a kind of a Kickstarter type thing where somebody, a teacher who has some reputation, says, uh, look, I can't share my course with you that I've used at university because uh, it belongs to the university. But I can create a Creative Commons version of a course for this particular subject in this particular language. And I'm going to spend all my weekends for the next two months doing it. And I may have to get a graphic designer in or something. Uh, but I'll, I'll take care of it. But it's probably going to cost me like $5,000 or something. So I need $5,000 to do it. And you have like a, 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 a crowdfunding for that. All the people who might need it chip in towards it. Now, we've got some very interesting models. It's not, just it's not that one-off thing. We've got some interesting kind of subscription models in there that make this easier, I think. The end result is that it's actually, you can actually uh, make a bit of extra income. Teachers who don't have a very good income could use a bit of spare time doing what they already know generating Creative Commons content that then helps a lot of people. So you don't get charged anything to get that content later. It's just you get, you're paying people to make the content. So that's, uh, that's it gives you some of the flavor of it. And, and as a user, um, you're on your phone. Say you're, you're scrolling through all of the teachers who are talking about your particular topic. You know, just like instead of looking at Facebook and you know, funny dog videos, um, you're, you're, you're just scrolling through and you go, oh, that's a good one. That'd be really good for my course. So you go share and up pops a menu with all your courses. And you share it straight to your course from your phone and it's now in your Moodle because it's all connected to your Moodle site. So, I don't know. I'm throwing word pictures here. We have some better diagrams, but you start getting the idea of what I'm talking about? It fills the gap that we have. We have a lot of gaps in between Moodles and in between people right now, and we have nothing there to fill it yet. So this is about building that thing that to fill it. And the way we want to build it is to make it not like these Silicon Valley kind of grabby, attention-grabbing uh, design. It's got to be designed really with educators in mind. It's got to be open, it's got to be transparent, it's got to be trustworthy, it's got to be transparent. Um, did I say that already? Um, it, it needs to be in, it, something you can trust. So that's, that's uh, something we're working on now already internally, and you'll be seeing more and more of that as it comes along. So that's how all those bits will fit together. And that's what Moodle's going to look like in a couple of years. There's one more thing. Um, this is where we're all, uh, where Moodle HQ is spread now. We have uh, a lot of people around the place. Um, we're growing. In particular, uh, we're opening a, a, we have a small office in Barcelona. We're, we're making that a big office in Barcelona. Uh, so we're really getting into being in Europe a lot more. Europe is where Moodle is very, very strong. Uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of funding a lot of uh, action around Moodle there. And um, so an office in Barcelona, we picked Barcelona. A, we have some people there already, but B, whenever I mention Barcelona, people go, ooh. <laughs> so I would love it. If you're in, in the area, come visit our Barcelona office next year. I'll be there quite a lot. So we're going to be busy little beavers. Um, you should get in on the beaver action. Here's, here's, here's how you can join us being busy. Um, get, get an app. Just get an app. It's not that much. You can convince somebody, surely. Um, don't be a wimp. Join the Moodle User Association. Just came up with a slogan for you. <laughs> use Moodle for research. Um, if you're doing any learning research, use Moodle, but share it. And there's things you can do in Moodle that you can't do on other platforms. You can create plugins and share them and collect more data from more institutions. 
which you know you have a wide base of data and you can do some quite wide scale research. If you just need a quick small Moodle site, get Moodle Cloud, use Moodle Cloud. If you need any consulting or hosting or any other services, go to our Moodle partners. If you if anything I've said has uh, excited you, uh, uh, please just collar us. Can I have everyone from HQ just stand up? Just uh, We've got about 20 of us here. We're all mostly wearing Moodle shirts, so these are all the Moodle people. They're very nice. They're quite huggable. Um, and uh, I don't know, just like, just get in their ears. Um, if there's any grant funding you know about that involves Moodle, please include us. Just you know, just remember to give us a call. You never know how we can help. Uh, or maybe come and join our team. We're hiring. It's so nice to be able to say that. Um, we're hiring in all areas. So you'll see a lot of ads coming up on Moodle.com and you'll see a new Moodle.com soon too. Um, so uh, yeah, we're hiring in Perth, out of Perth, all over the place. So finally, I just want to say that's, I think, what we should all be aiming for. And I wish you well in your own endeavours wherever you are in, in helping uh, us make the next generation look like that. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.